Good evening, everybody, um, and, and, and welcome to this uh, evening's presentation of the British Institute at Ankara's Sarat uh, project. My name is Stephen Mitchell. I'm the chair of the British Institute at Ankara. I'm not going to keep you, uh, take your attention for more than a couple of minutes, but just by way of introduction, uh, this project, which has run since 2017, has been, in essence, the British Institute at Ankara's flagship for the last three years, as the Institute, which represents the spectrum of social sciences, uh, historical sciences, humanities, and especially and traditionally archaeology, has uh, moved into the field of cultural heritage management with all the concomitant issues of protection, education, uh, raising public awareness of uh, a theme which in Turkey is of major importance and I think most people would acknowledge on a worldwide basis is of major importance. Speaking personally, I've been working in Turkey for nearly 50 years and going back to my first visits as an undergraduate student and traveling around uh, Turkey, visiting museums, visiting sites, looking at landscapes, I've seen uh, an environment which has changed out of all recognition at all possible levels urban, rural, density of population, uh, attitudes towards the foreigner coming into the country, um, at almost every possible level in one's experience of the country. And it was clear to me, I suppose, coming from Britain in the 1960s, just first of all, how strange and wonderful this country was, but also how exposed and vulnerable it was to change, which of course has now taken place in an uh, explosive way, I suspect especially since the 1980s, um, and protecting, appreciating, conserving uh, the heritage cultural, both the physical and the non-material aspects of that heritage, is really a major theme in the development of a country which, of course, is now a quite different place, both in world status and in terms of levels of education and understanding from what it was uh, 50 years ago. And I think that the program that we're about to see is something that I dare say is long overdue, that if the sort of engagement in the issues of had been confronted in 1990 rather than in 2015, a great deal more, I think there would have been great benefits, let, let us put it that way. But that's not to underestimate the fact that there are still great benefits to be achieved by a program of this sort, um, uh, which is an attempt, almost the first, of course, nothing is ever the first, there are always precedents and there are streams that come together, but this is a large-scale, consistent attempt to really bring both the British presence, as far as it can help in this, and the Turkish engagement with a material cultural heritage which is known about, but of course not fully understood, even by those who are closely professionally involved in it. And so, um, you know, the Sarah, that is why the British Institute seized the opportunity when uh, funding. Um, uh, a stream appeared that we could go for to make this a, a major platform for its activities, which it remains at, at the moment. 
So it's immensely important uh, to the British Institute. It's important to me personally as somebody who has been engaged and an observer and a participant, if you like, in, in the country in a, in, a modest, in a modest way. And I'm thrilled that the team has come here in force to present uh, some of their results to you and to give a sort of perspective as to what this has achieved and perhaps where it may lead. So I think then it's my pleasure to invite Stephanie Grant, who is, I had the title exactly, but I know that project was part of it, uh, <laughs> director of the, the project in the Cultural Protection Fund, to say a word or two and then take us into the evening's uh, business. Please. Hi. Um, I'll keep you for even less time because the funder's speech is always the most boring one. We've got lots of interesting things to learn. So um, I'm Stephanie Grant. I'm the Senior Programme Manager for the Cultural Protection Fund. Um, for those of you that don't know, the Cultural Protection Fund is a partnership between British Council and the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport. Uh, so far, we've awarded £30 million in uh, 51 projects, and they're across 12 different countries in the Middle East and North Africa. Um, we're safeguarding heritage that's at risk due to conflict, and that includes buildings, archaeological sites, uh, monuments, but then more intangible things like craft, stories, recipes, languages, and much, much more. Uh, the Cultural Protection Fund addresses a real global need to uh, protect our heritage and therefore protect our values and our identity. And we knew that we'd be funding some important and innovative work. Um, but we've been thrilled with what projects have delivered in terms of quality, um, flexibility and resilience, and weaving some really robust activities into you know, fragile contexts. Um, I've also had the pleasure of being the designated grants manager for the SARAP project since I started in the middle of last year, and I've really enjoyed working with the project team, so thank you. Um, I think it's fair to say that flexibility and adaptability have been key to this project's success, and we've been really impressed with the way that you've managed to deliver a successful project. Um, I think the incredible demand for your activities, which I'm sure you'll talk about, is you know, tantamount to the actual value of the heritage that you're protecting. And it tells a really great story for the Cultural Protection Fund um, in terms of our need for being the, the, you know, the heritage in Turkey that's really worth protecting and also the public value that's in that heritage. Um, on behalf of the Fund, I'd like to thank you all for your hard work and also for keeping a friendly face when I'm asking for many, many more reporting requirements, which I know can be heavy-handed. Um, so the fund now, we've got one more year of funding. We've got until March 2021 so that we can grow geographically and thematically. And SARAT and other projects are going to help us to make a really strong case to get more funding for Cultural Protection Fund in the future. So thank you very much for that. Thanks to Lute School and ESLA uh, for inviting me to come and say hi and uh, have a lovely evening. Good evening, everybody. I'm really glad that I have uh, today have the opportunity to say the opening words for um, the Sarat project. So Sarat, or safeguarding archaeological assets of Turkey is indeed a cultural protection fund and the cultural protection fund is administered and managed by the British Council as we just heard and the funding itself is coming from uh, the Department of Digital, Cultural, Media and Sports and it's ODA funding. The project itself, so safeguarding archaeological assets of Turkey, is a collaboration. So the BIA is the lead institution but we do work together with Anamet, which is a Turkish version for an acronym that stands for the Research Center for Anatolian uh, RC, Cultural Research Center Cultural <laughs> Anatolian Civilizations from Koç University and is located in Istanbul and ICOM UK. So it's a partnership, so we all work together and it's been really great to be able to actually set up a collaboration from the very beginning. The project started in 2017 and runs uh, till the end of March 2020. So, and we would like to present you the, pro the results that we have 
so far because the activities are actually still ongoing. It's less than it was before, but it's still not completely uh, ready or completely finished. So why did we think about starting the Sarat project? The British Institute at Ankara had been investing in cultural heritage management and heritage management projects since 2013. And one of the reasons for that is that the UK is one of the forerunners in heritage management and everything related to heritage management. Whereas Turkey has all the, uh, not all, but a lot of incredible remains. But heritage management is there actually still a, a, a, a new discipline. So we thought that we would be the ideal conduit. So we had been working on several projects in the southwest of Turkey. And it became more and more obvious that a more general approach throughout Turkey was absolutely needed. So that's why we uh, applied to the Cultural Protection Funds and were lucky enough to get the funding. So what aims do, does the Sarat project have? First of all, we uh, have been working on building capacity for safeguarding archaeological assets among heritage professionals. So I'm talking here about uh, museum professionals, but also uh, it's a very well wide area. I'm sure that in detail afterwards we'll say a bit more about the kind of people that have engaged with the projects. So heritage professionals, but we wanted to also reach out to the larger population, the wider population in Turkey. So raising public awareness on the importance of safeguarding assets in Turkish. And by raising awareness, of course, also increased knowledge and appreciation for this heritage, because it, it's, it's going hand in hand, basically. Last but not least, also promote the importance of integrity of archaeological records in view of their scientific value. Because, as probably all of you know, um, archaeological sites, archaeological assets are being looted, not just in Turkey, all over the world. So, and once those objects are no longer in their context, a large part of their value is actually lost. So, heritage professionals, but also the wider community, the whole population of Turkey. So now, how did we try to achieve these aims? So, several programs intertwined. First of all, an online certificate program on safeguarding and rescue archaeological assets, which is an online course uh, set up in collaboration with ICOM UK and Jane, who helped us setting the, the, the program up, is also here. Um, in collaboration also with Koch University, who has the whole equipment and everything. And uh, I mean, a large part of the content and the delivery uh, was done by the Sarah team and especially by Gül Bulhan. Secondly, a nationwide public opinion poll on the attitudes towards archaeology in Turkey, because Everybody in Turkey who is working on heritage management has been working without a baseline because everybody's imagining that things, specific programs would be good and would be accepted by the population without actually knowing what the population thought about the archaeological assets and their importance. So we uh, were able to do a nationwide uh, poll and the results are going to be presented today by Ushalai. Based upon the results of this poll, uh, we organized uh, archaeology in local context workshops, which are bringing the, the results of, this, um, of the poll towards local NGO, NGOs, local um, heritage workers, to see how they can work with the material they have in their immediate environment to, for the betterment of the local communities. Uh, we have also been doing uh, interviews with antiquities collectors, and there, of course, it's extremely important because all of the, they own very many shiny, beautiful objects, but the context is completely lost. So to raise awareness, awareness among them on, of the importance of not buying looted objects, first of all that, and second of all, uh, collectors are normally never heard. Their voice is silent, and everybody said they shouldn't be doing this, but nobody actually knows what moves them to um, collect. So there too, uh, Gül Pulhan has been doing interviews with them. And last but not least, uh, crucial towards the public opinion on archaeological assets, their importance, is of course the way journalists report on them. 
So not always, the reporting was not always done the way one would wish, and therefore we organized workshops with uh, rather a lot of uh, journalists who are reporting on archaeology in Turkey. That's just in a nutshell an overview of what we have been doing. You will hear more about that in detail very soon. And here we have the results in a nutshell. And I think that one, the, uh, um, um, some of the numbers that stand out are the large number of people that actually applied for the online course. Within the period of one year, more than 8,300 people applied for, to do the online course, which is really, uh, I think, uh, I mean, it was beyond our expectations, way beyond our expectations. But as you can see, also the other elements of the, of the programs were really well attended. By whom were these, was all of this done? Uh, so it's thanks to the British Council and the DCMS. Uh, the SARAT project was up, set up in, with two main committees. On the one hand, there was the steering committees where representatives of all the involved institutions were uh, represented. But the people who actually did the work on the field are these ladies, the executive committee. And um, I'm going to ask those of you who are actually here to get up when I uh, say your name. So you will... So I'm starting on that side. Uh, you will see very soon because she's going to do part of the presentation. Uh, Nurbanu Kocalan is the Sarat uh, media specialist. Next to her is Aish, in the back is Ayşe Gül Gülmaz, uh, Yilmaz, who is not here, but she was in heritage management consultant and has been instrumental in putting the archaeology in local context uh, together. Gülpulhan will also uh, be here uh, talking just after me. She's the project coordinator. Gülşah Günata is also here, and she is the Sarat BIA Anamet postdoctoral fellow. And Özlem Başdoğan is the Sarat heritage specialist. So it's been an um, all women project. It's uh, developed into an all women project. It was not at the start, but I think all together we have um, been doing quite a good job. Now, uh, Gül is going to talk uh, on the online program, but to give her the time to get uh, on, onto the, the port here, we are first going to show you a very brief overview of what we actually did. So the BIA is the leading institution in Sarat, a project awarded by the Cultural Protection Fund, and we are working together with uh, Anamet and Icon UK on, on this project. One of the most important elements of uh, Sarat is uh, an online course that we are developing. So the Sarat project partners with Anamet, the Research Centre for Anatolian Civilizations, as well as with myself in the department here. And we're looking at developing an online course and using the studio here at Coach um, in our online programs. Dersimizde hem arkeolojik varlıkların bugün karşı karşıya olduğu tehditler, onları korumak niye önemli gibi bir genel giriş var. Ondan sonra gerçekten acil durumlarda arkeolojik varlıklara, müzelere sit alanlarına, kütüphane gibi yerlere bir acil durumun öncesinde riski azaltmak için neler yapılabilir? Böyle bir acil durumla karşı karşıya kaldığımız anda neler yapabiliriz? Ve esas olarak da sonrasında neler yapabiliriz diye teorik pek çok örnekler de içeren bir bölümümüz var. Ondan sonra bir miktar pratik becerileri arttıracak fotoğrafçılıkla ilgili, konservasyonla ilgili birkaç dersimiz olacak uzmanların verdiği ve sonrasında da özellikle Türkiye'nin arkeolojik varlıklarının zenginliğini ve Türkiye'nin UNESCO Dünya Mirası ile olan e, ilişkisini anlattığımız e, bir Türkiye'ye özgü bir bölümle dersi tamamlıyoruz. Bu ders kültürel miras, arkeoloji gibi konulara ilgi duyan, bu konularda çalışan kişilere açık bir ders olacak. Hiçbir ücret karşılığı olmadan online şekilde ulaşabilecekleri bir şekilde e, Türkiye'den tüm katılımcılara açık olacak. We're really, really happy to be part of the Surat project. I think the course is not 
just a technical course, but something that's really about, um, as a museum professional, how you make collections accessible and you protect them for future generations. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming to um, hear um, our story of Sarat uh, tonight, after three years of hard work. Uh, my name is Gül Pulhan, as um, you had seen in the film and before. Um, I am the project coordinator of Sarat Project. And here, um, very quickly, I am going to give you an overview um, of the online course, um, uh, the interviews with the antiquities collectors and also with the workshops with journalists before um, passing on uh, the rest to Ishilai. Now, if we begin with our questions, why, why we did this um, program on safeguarding and rescuing archaeological assets, you know, why did we create um, such a training? Because um, we, we realize that um, risk assessment and preparedness is one of the few ways of actually combating with um, heritage losses, whether they are nature-induced or, or, or human-made. Um, and this is a very new and emerging area in the world. And there wasn't really um, any substantial activity or knowledge in this area in Turkey. And um, so we, we realized that this would have been a real contribution towards safeguarding archaeological assets in Turkey. So we followed the um, latest developments in the world and followed the latest um, you know, model that was developed by ICROM. That's basically what you do before, during, and after. And we enriched our program with further information on cultural institutions, what are the threats, and uh, why these archaeological assets are actually so important. You know, why, why do we want to protect them so much? So as you know, this was um, a true collaboration between um, uh, British Institute, ICOM UK, and um, Koch University. Uh, you know, I became the face of the online course, but you know, there is a whole team of people, you know, from course writers to uh, you know, uh, filmmakers to um, technical people, and um, moreover, of course, we had one um, person, um, I mean, one position in the program uh, that was um, solely responsible for the management um, of the course afterwards. So it was um, a great experience, really. And um, uh, the, the demand and the enthusiasm we received for this um, online training um, really uh, beyond um, our expectations. Um, and you know, we, we want to do more. I don't want to go over all these things, but uh, as, as I said, we enriched the um, risk management cycle um, with um, general information on cultural heritage, but also um, you know, some practical things to develop uh, practical skills, but also uh, you know, kind of um, in-depth information on the heritage assessments of Turkey. Uh, particularly uh, related to um, UNESCO um, World Heritage in Turkey. Uh, we wanted to make these um, online um, courses um, attractive, as attractive as possible um, for uh, the participants, and we wanted to enrich them uh, with, with various ways. So one of the things we did, and appreciated a lot actually by our participants, were putting um, interviews into the course by various um, international and Turkish experts on that specific area that was discussed in the episode. So, you know, we, we visited and interviewed with all these people. We had, you know, wonderful films that became part of the course, but also they are available on um, YouTube um, for, um, you know, uh, other people who did not uh, participate in the course um, to to listen to and um, to to use them. So uh, this was one of the best parts of the course. Uh, when we look at the numbers very very quickly, uh, we.
prepared the um, training almost um, in a year. I would say we uh, had lots of struggles, but tonight is the night to talk about the good parts of it. Um, but then the, uh, the implementation of it and offering of it was between April and end of December last year. And in this nine month, nine month period, um, we had, as you see, 8,327 um, applications for the course. Um, we offered um, places to over 5,000 people. And out of that 5,000 people, 3,809 people actually graduated and they received their um, you know, participation graduation certificate from um, Coach University. Uh, we particularly chose um, an, an application and selection uh, procedure because we wanted people to complete this course as, as much as possible. And although this was free in Turkish and, and a wonderful opportunity, but we wanted people to, to value it and to see that there was actually a, a competition, you know, uh, you know, we were looking for, um, you know, motivations, reasons why people were applying. Um, so, uh, but this application process also gave us an amazingly valuable data to see the heritage community in Turkey. So maybe this wasn't a, a, a planned result, but um, by doing this application, um, you know, form and, you know, gathering all that data, now we know, uh, you know, who are the people actually uh, are safeguarding or are going to safeguard Turkey's um, archaeological assets. And, you know, when we look at the geographical distributions, you can see that actually, um, and this is the geographical distribution of the graduates, not ap applicants. Um, we reached out everywhere in Turkey, other than three provinces out of 81. Gümüşhane, Hakkari, and Udur. So if we have a chance for a next term, you know, I'll, make, I'll personally make sure that we'll have people from these um, three provinces. Um, one of the things we were also looking at, how did people hear about um, our program? And the little chart there um, tells you that um, our um, you know, social media, and uh, Nurbanu is really our social media hero, uh, reach out to these people. But as the terms um, uh, go along, uh, hearing from their friends, hearing from other people became the next way of, um, you know, um, getting to know Sarat program, which is, for us, is, is a great achievement because uh, people were, fe were hearing it from social media, but also they were getting recommendations from their friends. You must do this course, you know, you must follow this course. So um, that's, in that sense, um, a great achievement. Although the course was in Turkish, uh, it, it had to be in Turkish, you know, to be, to be most effective in Turkey, but th this did not stop people um, internationally to take interest in the course as well. Um, I just put the numbers there. Obviously, these are um, Turkish people um, or Turkish-speaking people uh, living abroad. But you will also see that a large number from Azerbaijan and a large number from Cyprus. Um, so I, I, I am pretty sure the Azer, Azerbaijani people are not Turkish people, but you know, Azerbaijan is speaking and understanding Turkish. And um, Cyprus, mainly the Turkish part of the Cyprus, but um, there was a great demand. Actually, they, they even approached us to do a special course for the Cyprus um, director of directorate of of museum, so you know if it shows that if we do this uh, course maybe in another language in another time, um, it will be very useful. So who are um, who are the graduates of this course? So this is um, this is a very um, general division of who these people are. I can proudly say that they are mostly women. So it's appropriate for a, you know, surely a woman team. Um, you know, in line with um, Turkey's population, it's mostly um, quite young people, uh, let's say between um, 25 and 35. 
but when we look at the distribution, um, young academics and um, postgraduate students are the highest category, 30%. Then we have the second largest uh, category, 28%. We are calling it freelancers, and this tells you a lot about the heritage community in Turkey. These people do not have permanent jobs, but they have not given up in their professions either. These are mostly archaeologists, but also architects, conservators, um, and you know, similar, maybe urban planners, similar areas, but mainly archaeologists. Whenever there is a project, they go and work, so maybe they work three months, four months, a year, um, and then they are unemployed, but um, you know, they are keen continuing in their jobs, and it seems like you know, there was a great interest from this kind of people to our course, because that, that also kept their link and connection um, you know, with the field and with the latest development, so um, that was uh, very useful to see. Uh, the museum people, uh, which is like, in a way, our main target um, is um, in total, um, we divided them into three groups, um, but in total they are 11% um, you know, people who are working in the state archaeology museums and the ministry itself, uh, people uh, working in the um, other type of museums in Turkey, these can be private museums, but also foundation and municipality museums, but also um, um, people working in the palace museums. And then, you know, we had a great interest from uh, municipalities or, or you know, uh, local governments, um, you know, relevant departments like, um, you know, urban, urban planning or um, UNESCO World Heritage and so on. But we also attracted, you know, legal professionals, maybe in small numbers, but security people and so on. Which is, which is very valuable. And, um, you know, we have lots of numbers about these people's reactions and, um, you know, um, opinions about the, the training, but I think the, the greatest result is 98% um, said that they will definitely or they're very likely to enroll in another program that will be offered by us. So that, that is a great assurance uh, for all of us. Now, the um, second um, program that I was um, uh, responsible, uh, besides coordinating the, the project, was the um, interviews with the antiquities collectors in Turkey. So why, um, why did we want to do this? You know, why are we interested in the art, um, antiquities collectors? Because um, it is a legal thing in Turkey to be, you know, if one follows certain rules, one can be an antiquities collector in, in Turkey, uh, but, but nevertheless, they are part of the problem. They are, they are part of the story, and we wanted to hear their voices. Uh, mainly, of course, we wanted to make them aware of the scale and nature of the you know, illicit trade in antiquities, the destruction it's caused by this trade, and the importance of context for um, archaeological objects. Actually, um, in every activity we do, whether it's interviews with the collectors, it's the online course itself, or you know, workshops with the journalist, you know, the underlining foundation of our understanding was actually pushing this you know, holistic approach to archaeology, the integrity. It's not just about the objects, but it, it's the whole archaeological sites, everything excavated or unexcavated, you know, the importance of uh, preserving this and, you know, trying to uh, make people um, understand this. Now, um, I, I started interviewing the, uh, interviewing the registered um, antiquities collectors, but I suddenly realized that I needed to expand this a little bit to people still, um, you know, very much um, part of this story, like the private archaeology museum directors who are, you know, having or still acquiring um, archaeological objects, or um, museum, official museum personnel who dealt or dealing with the collectors, um, if possible, sometimes security forces who, who are willing to talk and who dealt uh, with the collectors, 
um, and um, you know, a couple of conservators who are helping uh, to the collectors because they are, they are, they, they all have things to add uh, to this conversation. Um, I, I have a standard list of um, 73 questions that I am um, asking to the collectors, uh, but if I am talking to um, other type of um, people, of course I am then um, you know, asking different, different questions, but, but basically I would like to hear about the collector herself or himself, about the collection, about their acquisition practices, um, you know, issues they want to raise, their expectations, their suggestions, and then finally I begin to talk about awareness. Um, just, um, you know, very, uh, very few, um, let's say, preliminary um, results at this stage. Uh, first of all, they are very cooperative. You know, I was hesitant how I would be, the Sarat project would be um, received by them. Um, they, are, um, they are very willing to talk. Of course, they say what they want to say, um, you know, uh, but they are, they are answering all the questions. Um, you know, they are uh, quite concerned about the future of their collections. Um, they, they say very interesting things about the market. They say less things about their acquisition practices, uh, understandably, but I am putting the pieces together. But um, I, I just want to conclude this part by uh, saying two things about, uh, about the market and about their um, future plans. They, they all want to open a museum. You know, there isn't a single one that I interviewed so far that didn't want this. Uh, they, they all want to be thanked, you know. They, they want to feel a great prestige and pride in, in what they are doing. Um, I, you know, I really push them, you know. I say, tell me another line that if you don't buy, this is going to go abroad. You know, I, I need more than this. So, um, but you know, they, they, this is still the, the, still the standard answer they are giving. Um, but younger generations, their um, children are not interested in uh, collecting antiquities. They are not interested in uh, continuing these um, collections. So they are very worried about what to do. Either they want to, uh, you know, donate them to the museums or they want to open their own museums. When I um, ask about the market, they, they say that, most of them say that, well, they all say that there are less objects in the market. Some of them said that because, um, you know, there are more controls, they are very afraid of, they are going to, into trouble, they are aware of what is happening in the Middle East, they are aware of the bans and so on, more than I, I expected actually. But then one collector from Eastern Turkey, I think quite an exceptional character from Doğbeyazıt of all places. He said that of course there are less objects in the market because archaeological sites are diminishing, you know. There isn't much left to put on the market. I think that was something very, very telling. Um, so I still have a few more uh, to do in these interviews and then I think we will have much more substantial results. Now, finally, um, the um, journalist, as, as Lut uh, mentioned, uh, we wanted to contribute um, um, to the, um, you know, quality or increase the quality of archaeological uh, writing. Um, we wanted um, kind of ethical reporting to take place, um, and, but we also wanted to provide some kind of a support system to the journalists because we know that they are struggling um, reaching out to, um, you know, uh, accurate, um, correct information. You know, they are all fighting against time when they are trying to, you know, uh, deliver their, um, you know, p pieces against uh, short deadlines and so on. Um, so we did various things, but I think one very useful thing we we wrote we we wrote a little booklet with. Um, Urbano about you know basic archaeological terminology and archaeological procedures and so on that became very po popular even museums want them now 
Um, and we started with this grandiose idea that we were going to create Ask an Expert network. Now we are actually achieving to this um, network, but on local basis. So in every workshop uh, we do, there we are connecting the uh, local archaeologist with the local journalist, and it's it's already you know uh, forming um, in a very natural way. So the network is actually happening at the workshops and, um, you know, journalists are very, very willing uh, to continue. Uh, we, uh, you know, we, we tell them what we think as archaeologists is, is not right with what is reported. Uh, you know, we discuss the importance of the correct angles and the wrong angles and how, how this is um, forming, um, you know, general public's opinion. Uh, and um, it was basically our team and um, a senior editor helped us um, in these workshops. Uh, but, but one of the things we get back is a feedback that actually they want to see some famous journalist with us when we are doing these workshops. So maybe, you know, if there is a next time, we will maybe include a few famous names um, in these workshops. Um, we, the, the yellow um, dots are uh, showing you the workshops we did um, uh, with journalists. So there are five, um, five cities, uh, but we, we look at it in a regional way. And um, you can, even from this map, you can see that we kind of ignored the Black Sea and the <laughs> Central Anatolia. Of course, Istanbul is very important because all the national media is centered in Istanbul. So uh, maybe we should do even uh, more workshop in Istanbul. But uh, we, if we are able to continue um, uh, next year um, with Sarat, we would like to do more journalist workshops um, in the Black Sea and in Central Anatolia and um, in the East. Yes, when I am going to hand over um, to Ishilai, and, and before that, we again have a little film that will give you a taste of our uh, journalists' workshop. But uh, before showing you that film, I just want to say, um, you know, a few words about the team and to thank um, all of them, um, the ones who are here, but also the ones who are not um, with us tonight. Uh, in our Sarat team, um, Gülşah, Özlem, and Işılay were my graduate students. Now they are my colleagues, and I'm actually learning from them. Nurbanu was not my student, <laughs> an exception, but she made me a witness to her marriage. So I, I ask you, which one is a bigger responsibility, you know, <laughs> being a teacher or being a witness? Um, we also had a wonderful team to do the visual um, recording uh, of, of the project. So our photographer, Janelle, and our film uh, making crew, um, uh, Koray, um, Ekin, um, and Jahid, you know, we, we traveled abroad, we tra traveled all around in Turkey all together, and uh, the, the crutch I have was, you know, due to one of those um, film adventures um, in Batman at the end of October that uh, ended my, um, you know, breaking my ankle and becoming immobile after, <laughs> after uh, you know, going around so many thousands of kilometers. Um, I leave you with the uh, workshop, um, journalist workshop film, um, and then Ushilai will tell you the rest of the story, and then we will be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Arkeoloji haberciliği atölyeleri Sarat projesi kapsamında gerçekleştirdiğimiz ve gazetecilerle arkeologları bir araya getirdiğimiz buluşmalar oldu. Bu buluşmaları yapmaktaki ana amacımız basında yer alan arkeoloji haberlerinin dil, içerik, yöntem açısından niteliğinin arttırılması için gazetecilerde bir farkındalık yaratmaktı. Zaten e, ekstradan düzgün bir içerik ürettiğiniz zaman 
hedef ve yöntem birbirine uyum sağlayacak diye düşünüyorum. Yani tabii ama sigvarisi de aslında beni rahatsız ediyor. Yani bizi sıkıştırıyor bunu hepimiz yaşamışızdır. Hadi çabuk ol. Ee, ne zaman araya tabii. geçersin? Evet. Mayıs Ağustos 2019 tarihleri arasında İzmir, Antalya, İstanbul, Bursa ve Diyarbakır'da toplamda 102 gazeteciyle bir araya geldik. Katılımcılarımızın arasında hem yerel medyada hem ulusal medyada çalışan editörler, muhabirler, televizyon programcıları, basın birimlerinde çalışan medya uzmanları ve iletişim öğrencileri vardı. Tüm gün süren etkinliklerde Basında yakın zamanda yer alan arkeoloji haberlerinde sıklıkla yapılan hataları ve aslında doğru yaklaşımlar neler olabilir bunları düşündük ve gazetecilerle beraber akıl yorduk. O vermiş yani o an 4 bin yerine 4 yüz ama sizin orada binlerce yıllık anlattığınız hikaye değişiyor. Arkeoloji haberlerinde doğru yaklaşımlar neler olabilir? Bu konular üzerine konuştuğumuz toplantılarda kaçakçılık, definecilik gibi faaliyetlere teşvik eden bir dilden uzak durulması, muhakkak haberlerde bir uzman görüşüne, bir arkeolog görüşüne yer verilmesi, sosyal medyada ya da farklı yerlerde çıkan iddiaların muhakkak teyit edilmesi, zamanlar ya da yerlerle ilgili bilgilerin teyit edilerek yazılması gibi konularda gazetecilere bu konunun önemini değindik ve yakın zamanda basında yer almış arkeoloji haberleri üzerinden bu haberlerdeki doğru yaklaşımlar neler olabilir bunları konuştuk. Çünkü biz biliyoruz ki toplumda arkeolojik varlıkların korunmasında bir farkındalığın oluşması için medyaya çok önemli bir görev düşüyor. Good evening everyone. It's a really a great pleasure to be with you here today and I think I would also like to start with thanking some of the key people I see in this room because first of all it's a great pleasure that all my colleagues are here, team members, friends now, that it has been the most um, a very interesting, very sincere learning process from each other doing, uh, doing Sarat project. But also at the very beginning, our first grant manager, Sally Smith, is here. So I would like to thank her for all the support. And I would like to thank our current grant manager, Steph, for all this continuing support. And Carol and Scott is uh, here today. You have seen how much uh, work Sarat has created, and she's evaluating all that work, and it's a big thing. And Jane Meeks is here. She also helped uh, develop in the online course. So it is really a room full of people with whom Sarat could be made possible. So let me start with thanking everyone at the very beginning. Uh, I'm going to very briefly present you the results of the nationwide public opinion poll uh, results uh, because um, one of the things that Sarat aimed to achieve was to create awareness and was to reach out to the general public. And one of the ideas was if we do not know what the existing relationship between the public and archaeology is in Turkey, we actually cannot construct that relationship. So that was like a starting point. And actually, I'm presenting this as the last, but this was the very first thing that Sarat did in 2018. Um, and it was, con it was um, conducted by a professional company because, I mean, you can think of, you know, like this election results surveys that they may guess, like how, how much uh, the political parties are going to be voted. So it's very similar to that. So I'm not going to go into too much methodology. Uh, you just have to take my word for it that it's a very reliable methodological approach, but I'm very happy to discuss it afterwards if you have questions. Well, how we worked was that uh, we had um, 65 questions that were prepared in consultation with experts working in this field in Turkey. And then this company went over all these questions because some of these questions were sometimes a little bit too complicated, not too direct. So uh, if you have a look at the final questions, they are very simple, they are very to the point and they are very clear. So they might sometimes seem, seem a bit banal, but I can tell you that if you have a look at all that data in relation to each other, that it makes a lot of sense. Like you can read different demographics and how people react to certain things coming from different backgrounds. Uh, so uh, we, we talked to 3,601 people face to face, so we, which means that 
this uh, field team of the, of the company went to the doors of all these people and conducted these questionnaires. Um, maybe this is a method that wouldn't have worked very well in other contexts, but in Turkey it did. Uh, so if we were to do this on an, as an online survey or as a telephone interview, we, might, we wouldn't be able to get all these results. So this was a methodology that was very uh, well received in Turkey. Then we did some follow-up interviews for a couple of matters that needed more investigation, which I'm going to share with you in a minute. So let me introduce our, um, the people that we uh, interviewed, uh, a little bit of the demographics. So some of these 65 questions were related to the demographics, um, and they are very much in line with the Turkey demogra demographics. That's what makes it uh, Turkey representative, right? Um, so you can see uh, gender distribution, age, uh, settlement type, rural, urban, metropolitan, education, which is a very important component of uh, the attachment between archaeology and people. And also another thing that needs probably a little bit of uh, explanation is the lifestyle question, which out outside of Turkey maybe it's a little bit difficult to, um, to explain. Uh, so people were asked, they, they were given three um, lifestyle choices, and they were asked, which one do you think you would fit the most? So the company or us, we didn't put people into certain boxes, but we asked people which one they would choose. So modern was one of the uh, boxes. 35% of the people identified themselves as modern. 38, 39 uh, said they were traditional conservative and 26 said that they, they were religious conservative. This was one of the very important determinant factor in, uh, in the relationship between archaeology and, and people. So uh, there were three different um, categories of questions that were related to archaeology itself. So the first one is understanding of archaeology, like the knowledge, values, meanings, and all these um, parts that are to the, to the you know, heart of archaeology. So one of the questions that uh, usually these kinds of surveys start is what comes to your mind when you hear the word whatever you are researching, and in our case, archaeology. And one of the ideas to do this was to understand whether people were interested, they, are, they were knowledgeable, or they wanted to know more about archaeology. And also, sometimes we had experts' beliefs that you know, people in Turkey don't even know what archaeology as a word means. They are so not interested that they wouldn't you know, be able to tell you what it's all about. Our data shows that this is not true, because it's only 17% of the people that didn't have an answer to this question, but the rest said something. And uh, mostly, uh, they were thinking of excavation or signs of excavation. This was asked open-ended, and then the, the answers were categorized into these uh, categories. Another question in this context I'm going to show you is about the values. Uh, because again, sometimes uh, we hear this notion that people do not give any, any value to archaeology in Turkey, which was completely not true, uh, because only 3% of the people uh, said that archaeological assets have no value. The others assigned some value. This was, uh, these choices were given to the people, but uh, they could choose more than one. So they could choose intangible and scientific together. And the most uh, highest category, as you see, is 60% almost, as intangible. And this, this finding was one of the reasons why we did the in-depth interviews, because we wanted to understand what people meant with intangible, because it's quite a personal thing. Um, but, and I can also say that despite all this, you know, association of archaeology with tourism, with making more um, money out of uh, these assets, monetary, the financial value assigned to archaeological heritage was only the fourth category that came to people's minds. So this is also quite an important uh, finding. Uh, we also wanted to know, to us, there were some, some sites that we thought that would be known by most of the people in Turkey. Uh, and as a follow, as a question before this one, we asked, can you please tell us the three archaeological sites that come to your mind? So it was an open-ended question. And the, the first three that you see here were actually those uh, uh, answers. So people said uh, Hagia Sophia, Topkapı Palace, and Ephesus were the ones that came to their minds when they uh, were asked to give a, a site name. And the rest were our editions. So we wanted to, to, to see uh, when we say 
are you familiar with Mr. Hassan Keif? How many of the people would say yes? So these, all these um, site names were read out loud to the, to the people. And you can see the ranking. So um, Göbekli Tepe is 15%, uh, and uh, Ayasofya Sofia is 78%, and this is the Turkey uh, result. And just to remind you that this survey was done in 2018, and Göbekli Tepe became quite more famous with all those Netflix and uh, movies and uh, discussions. So probably it would have been a little bit more higher if we were to do it now. But apart from that, these are uh, the numbers that uh, so show familiarity. Um, while we were, after we got the results of the survey, some questions, some answers gave us hope and gave us like, yes, uh, there, are, there are going to be good uh, communication campaigns from this finding. Some of them made us go like, hmm, what is hmm? So this is the hmm. Um, because, you know, think about a country that's so very proud of the rich archaeological heritage and everybody talks about it, but when someone asks you, open-ended, can you name one civilization that lived in Turkey before us, almost 50% of the population didn't have an answer for that question. And then the, the category that's highly uh, thought about are the Hittites and then Ottomans. Uh, and you can see, and the rest is really like uh, very uh, small percentages. Uh, of course, if we were to ask this question in another, in another format, like have you heard of Hittites or Ottomans, we would get uh, higher answers. But since it was asked open-handed, uh, this is the, the, um, the picture that we are faced with. I pressed the button too quick. This was my uh, you know, question to ask and discuss with you, but it's too late now, you have seen the, the results. Um, so one of the questions that uh, made us think and discuss a lot after we got the results was also this. So this was asked um, as what civilizations have formed today's Turkey with four options, and we asked people to choose only one. So they couldn't go for two, uh, two choices. Um, and you see that the, the uh, choices are Turks, civilizations of thousands of years, Seljuks and Ottomans, and Muslims. We actually wanted to see whether people, whether people were going to choose civilizations of thousands of years or something that is more definitive, something that's going to take them out of that box. But almost 50% of the population chose the uh, uh, common uh, idea of thousands of civilizations. And this is, as I said, was one of the, um, the answers that, was, that received the most um, discussion. And um, we also asked about engagement with archaeological assets. So do, does um, archaeological assets have any, any um, place in their lives? Do they do something with it? Do they go and visit? Are, are they willing to uh, make it a part of their um, agenda, things like that. So uh, some of the findings are, uh, have you ever visited an archaeological site? As you can see, 48% have. 12% uh, have a stronger interest, so they do have a museum card. Uh, and 68% said that they, they thought that people didn't visit archaeological sites because of the entrance value, entrance fees. And 78% said that they would uh, give a call to the police if they were to see an illicit excavation going on. And uh, this actually uh, was something that surprised us when we first uh, showed it. It's a bit too, too high to be true. They wouldn't. But then when we were doing follow-up workshops, which I'm going to also show a movie, because I also am going to end with a movie, and in that, in that workshop, there was always a representative from the security forces. And they said that actually this is law because they receive a lot of calls from uh, the local uh, people when they see something like an illicit digging. So that's something uh, about the way we see and they experience. Um, let me tell you a little bit about how we can look at the demographics and how we can have a look at um, the engagement and who are the people who are engaging and who are the ones that are not in engaging. Uh, so that as a follow-up question to have you ever visited an archaeological site, uh, we asked if to those who said no, are you planning to do so? And I'm showing you the first uh, category is the Turkey representative category. 20% said yes, I'll do it. 60% I would, 
if I had an opportunity. Another 20 says no, and it's a no. And I'm showing you, uh, according to lifestyle, how this um, changes. So you can see a drastic uh, change in the way people respond to this follow-up question. Just a few words about this opportunity, because I think that was also one of the findings of our in-depth interviews that followed the uh, questionnaire. Um, people were mostly concerned about, um, okay, entrance fees was one of the factors that they didn't go, but they were also very concerned about the fact that if I go to an archaeological site and if I don't understand anything, that's really bad. That's what's keeping me away from going to an archaeological site. I see foreigners, they go with their guides, but I don't even speak the language, so I cannot, you know, become a part of that group. And if I go to an archaeological site, I really want to understand what's going on. Otherwise, I'll lose my time, I'll lose my money, and I'm going to feel really bad. So this was one of the ways that they described why they wouldn't go and visit an archaeological site. So if someone brought them, they would go. So, of course, the important question about the treasure, because we get a lot of comments about, you know, if you say you're an archaeologist, there are a lot of comments about, did you find the treasure? What, where is the treasure? All these discussions. Uh, we thought about how to ask this question a lot, and in the end, we wanted people to think about a person, a real person, a real event, go there in their minds and answer accordingly. Not like hypothetically, but accor according to that, that person. And this is the answer. So 7% of the people said that they know someone who found a treasure, that really found a treasure. And we can have a look at that geographically, which is quite interesting. It changes from different places. It's mostly the Aegean coast that has higher answer, yes answer to this question, something that we can discuss. Lastly, I'm going to show you some of the general approaches towards archaeological assets. Um, these were questions, these, these were sentences that were read to the respondent, and then they, we were asked to, to they, they were asked to say how much they agree to those sentences. So uh, almost 50% approve the work that works of foreign archaeologists in Turkey are beneficial for the development of archaeology, whereas almost 90% of those peop of people agree that artifacts smuggled abroad should be returned to Turkey. 82% accept the archaeological remains as part of their own culture, and 67% think that archaeological assets are not sufficiently protected in Turkey. The um, um, questions and a brief report is available on Sarat's website. If you are interested, you can have a look at the uh, questions. And if you would like to know more about any of those questions, you can always contact us and we are very happy to share uh, what kind of answers we got for these, um, for these questions in the survey. So very general, we can say that uh, actually there is interest about archaeology, but the knowledge is really low. Uh, and, but archaeology as a concept is, is known. Uh, and welcomed, actually, by the communities. Uh, we also see that um, social media is one of the most important channels that people reach out to, uh, to um, um, information about archaeology, and lifestyle, income, and education seem to be the most important factors, as you wouldn't be surprised, but these are also confirming uh, this um, approach. Um, what, did we did, we do, what did we do with this uh, findings? Actually, we always try to make sure that we are building the messages of uh, Sarat that try to reach out to public based on this, on these findings. So uh, we are using social media as an important venue. Uh, but we also did face-to-face uh, -face meetings. So we went to some of the cities and we met with the local influencers, local stakeholders, and we told them about the findings of the, more in detail, of course. We told them about, discussed the results, and we also gave them some examples of um, how archaeology can be used as an economic and social res resource and shared some, some, some uh, projects with them. And you can see where we have uh, been. And I'm going to end with a movie of showing you that atmosphere when we were there meeting with these um, uh, uh, stakeholders. Sarat projesi kapsamında hayata geçirdiğimiz ana programlardan bir tanesi yerelde arkeoloji toplantılarıydı. 
toplantıları geçtiğimiz Eylül, Ekim, Kasım 2019 döneminde 6 ilde gerçekleştirdik. Bu iller Burdur, Gaziantep, Şanlıurfa, Tunceli, Kırklareli ve Nevşehir'de. Bu illerdeki arkeolojik varlıkların korunması ile ilgili çalışan kurumlara özellikle ulaşmaya çalıştık bu toplantılar aracılığıyla. Tarihi Kültürel Diyalog Derneği Başkanı Halil Eyboğlu. Şimdi ben burada en büyük bir sıkıntımızı dile getirmek istiyorum. Halkın zeyne inip onları e, arkeoloji ve e, koruma konusunda eğitmek yani büyük başarı e, tebrik edip e, saygıyla e, selamlıyorum Çok bütün ekibinizi. Turizm alanında, özellikle Ufala turizm alanında da e, desteklerimiz, önceliklerimiz, stratejilerimiz artmaya başladı. Gaziantep Kültür Varlıkları Koruma Bölge Kurulu Müdürü. Umarım çalışmalarımız hedeflediğiniz noktaya ulaşacaktır. Aslında bu tanışma aksesinin daha erken olması gerekiyordu ama biz tabi bunun öncelikle e, yerel halk tarafından arkeolojik varlıkların daha iyi tanınması ve bunun öncelikle farkına varılması konusunda çok önemli adımlar atılması gerektiğini düşünüyoruz. Yani Türkiye'nin haritasını çizdiğimiz vakit hangi şehrine hangi eseri koyacağız haritada yer bulamıyoruz. Yerel ve arkeoloji toplantılarını iki içerik üzerine inşa ettik. Bu içeriklerden ilki 2018 yılının Mayıs ayında yaptırdığımız bir kamuoyu araştırmasıydı. Türkiye'de ilk defa toplumun arkeoloji ve arkeolojik varlıklarla ilgili ne düşündüğünü anlamaya dairdi. %36 oranında insanların aklına arkeoloji deyince hemen kazı gelmiş. Siz de belirttiniz zaten. Başka sorular da aklımıza geldi. Çok doğru. Ankette her zaman daha farklı şey düşündü. Sorsaydık keşke şu gereksiz olmuş gibi şeyler çıkıyor. Yerelde arkeoloji toplantılarının ikinci içerikleri ise arkeolojinin yerelde sosyal ve ekonomik nasıl katkılar yaratabileceğiyle ilişkindi. Bu faydaları anlatabilmek için dünyadan ve Türkiye'den çeşitli örneklere değindik. Normalde olduğu gibi İçişleri Bakanlığı'ndan değil, İtalya Kültür Bakanlığı'ndan gidiyor. Bu da tahmin edersiniz ki işleri çok verimli hale getiriyor. Etkileyen çok temel bir faktör giriş ücreti. Yani bu bu yüzde yüz yani hiç şüphe yok. Bu örnekler ve kamuoyu araştırmasının sonuçlarıyla birlikte toplumların arkeolojiyle daha iyi bir ilişki kurmasını o kentler özelinde tartışmış olduk. Arkeoloji ilgim Göbekli Tepe'den sonra başladı. Benim için Tunceli için yapılacak yapılan ve yapılacak her şey çok değerli. Katılmak, dinlemek, bilgilenmek istedim. Trakya'da bu toplantının ilk olduğunu biliyoruz. Bu bize gerçekten çok heyecan verdi. Ev sahibi olmak bizi gururlandırdı. Ee, böyle bir ekiple e, sizlerle bu paylaş çalışmayı yapıyor olmak İl Kültür ve Turizm Müdürlüğümüz olarak bize çok büyük bir onur veriyor. Indeed, this was Sarat project, still in a nutshell, but I do think that it gave an idea of uh, how many different elements there actually were to the project. Now, um, what is important is that each and every step of the project has been meticulously, meticulously recorded and documented because lots, most of the elements of the project are actually replicable in other situations and other contexts. So all of the uh, films, the booklets, everything will be available on the BIA website for uh, future reference. However, as uh, it was already mentioned several times, we do hope that we are going to be able to continue at least for one year and we'll know about the outcome of the application, <laughs> the application we, we uh, put in in, in, a, in a few weeks' time. So I would like to end um, once again by thanking the team, thanking our grant managers from the Cultural Protection Fund because they always had our backs. So, I mean, thank you very much. Without you, it was not, would not have been possible. Uh, and also Carol for the lovely um, evaluation report that she wrote. And thank you for listening. And I think that Dr. Aileen Orbaşlı is now going to take to lead on the question round. No? Thank you very much.
Sarat team on the work that you're doing, and particularly Lutz, Gul, and Ashalai for this wonderful presentation that took a very complex concept, idea, a huge amount of work, and put it into a format that was um, both informative but also enjoyable and, and very succinct. So I, a big thank you um, to all of you uh, for that. Um, yes, we are all hoping it will uh, continue, and I think it's also it's a very interesting point as many other cultural protection fund projects are coming to fruition, coming to an end, so I think there's a lot of horizon searching, if you like, to look at how some of these projects can continue, how they can create new partnerships um, and open up new avenues um, of research. And I think in all research, in all projects, I think the first question is, what was the finding that you were not expecting to find? And I think this project has multiple unexpected uh, results, and, and mainly in a very positive, positive sense. But um, the floor is yours. Um, I think, should we invite the three speakers up here, Matt? And do we have a microphone? Oh, oh, perfect. Um, so, any questions to the Sarat team? Um, my question is for Gul. I just wanted to, I was interested in um, the questions that you were asking uh, private collectors. And um, I'd like to ask whether they had any concept of context and were they interested in the context of the artifacts that they were buying and collecting? Um, no, they are not. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs> uh, they, they have, um, let's put it this way, um, uh, their knowledge um, about archaeology in terms of, you know, academic uh, knowledge and chronology and so, so on uh, varies a lot from collector to collector. Uh, there were very few that, that I encountered who, are, uh, who really know what they are talking about in terms of, um, you know, civilizations, cultures, dates, etc. Uh, but um, they are not too interested in the uh, context. They have an idea that just having an object in your hand in an in a, in a illicit thing is actually destroying a lot of things. They know that, but they are not aware of the cruciality of it. Um, you might not want to share this, but the question is, what was your greatest challenge on this project? Because obviously, it was a not always smooth going, I know. If you can say. I think we can say. Uh, uh, originally, the online program was not planned. We had planned to go and actually work with several museums, uh, especially in the southeast of Turkey, but also Istanbul and, uh, and Antalya. And that just didn't work out because we didn't manage to get all the collaboration and a memorandum of understanding set up with the Turkish authorities. So I think that that was the main challenge. But it became an opportunity. It became, yes, we turned it around uh, into an opportunity and I, we would never have reached over 8,000 people. Uh, so it, in the end it turned out better than it was originally planned. I just wanted to say, I hope you can do it in Arabic. <laughs> I have a question for Ishalai. Uh, the, the list of potential answers to the question, what value do you find in, what was it, archaeological remains? Or, yeah, we talked about this before. Um, the list was, it, it's strange to me, intangible, tangible. How did you come up with those particular options for people to choose? rather than, for instance, history or heritage or, you know, my past or the past or... So why those particular options? Actually, those options were probably coming from the literature surveys that we had a look. But one of the things that was quite amazing to us as well was when we put Manevi, intangible, in it. And then we had this discussion about what it really means, because the other categories are quite straightforward, like financial, scientific, artistic, uh, and there is the other category, I mean, for anyone that wanted to put something else. Uh, I think there was also historical, I don't remember now historical. Uh, but um, 
it turned out that people, when asked about archaeology, for two reasons go for intangible. One of them was those people who identified archaeological re remains with religion more, so they assigned a religious value which they thought was intangible, obviously. Mm -hmm. And those people who, even though they selected like ar scientific, artistic, they started their answer with intangible because they thought, I like it so much that it has this value that I cannot put it in a tangible format. Mm -hmm. So I want to separate it and put it somewhere else kind of uh, approach to, to archaeological assets. So um, the answer to your question is that basically it was mostly uh, similar surveys and also discussions with the company that what are the, the options that would work, giving always the other as the other, uh, you know, open uh, choice. Mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, intangible was the most uh, interesting finding of the question. Thanks. I thought it was particularly interesting that you went to collectors and also to the press, um, to the journalists, not, not yeah. just industry workers, students, whatever. Um, I wonder, and this is a question for myself really, um, I wonder wh whether one would get the same response from journalists in this country. I don't know. I'd be interested to get comments from others. Um, and, in, and I suppose at the end, I'm also interested, in a sense, were, were your processes actually reinforced for themselves? Because when you then did the public survey, how has that been covered in the Turkish press? And do you, th and uh, has it been released yet? And I suspect it has from what you said. How has it been covered in the Turkish press? And do you think you got your, your, um, your benefit from it? one would hope that it's got much stronger coverage in the Turkish press because of the journalist studies, the journalist um, um, seminars that you ran. Um, and, so, and do you think you have made a difference with those journalists moving forward and all the things that, that are going with it? Um, I think there isn't one um, simple answer to your question or co comment. One thing is we, we wanted... Um, the results of the, well, not only the results, but actually, you know, such an opinion poll has been conducted in Turkey, you know, and, and these are the results of it. Uh, we wanted to disseminate that knowledge and make it an in, in ter, integral part of the project. So we actually uh, allocated one episode, the final episode of the online course, uh, like a panel discussion to the results um, of the opinion poll. So with that, actually, all the participants of the online training would have a first-hand discussion of the results between myself, Ushilai, and someone from the poll company. With the journalists, when we were doing the workshops, um, again, we, we shared some highlights uh, from the... Uh, from the uh, opinion poll, and, and we informed them that you know such an such an information exists and it's it's for their use and and so on. Uh, but for um, in some ways um, to um, protect the project and to um, to be able to continue with all the remaining activities, we did not make a very big. Um, press issue out of this um, opinion poll. I mean, we could have, we could have made, we could have made it, uh, you know, a real news in the press, uh, but we chose not to do it because um, we didn't want to be in a position um, to be, you know, questioned by the uh, officials like, who are you, you think you are, you know, taking the pulse of the, um, you know, public in Turkey. Yeah. I think that goes well with the challenge of the... Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah. yeah. So that was one of the challenges. Yeah. That was a, though it was a decision not to, and now maybe um, when the project ends, we are planning to do it. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, we did this uh, announcing, putting all the results in an accessible format online. 
and so people can just go and uh, search for it because it is very rich so we, we should be able to share it more. But then there were some local um, like reporters who attended the journalist workshops or they were interested so they approached us and we talked when they approached to us, uh, we gave information but we never wanted to make it like we could have done a big, you know, press conference and, you know, kind of, it would be in the headlines maybe for a day, but it, it would have been very easily. But we, we decided to play a low-key <laughs> thing. Um, and maybe for the, you know, greater good of the project, it was maybe the right decision. Uh, but that wasn't, um, I mean, Ankara is not really a center for press. I mean, you know, the real center is Istanbul. Um, and then, um, then um, well, okay, everywhere in Turkey is archaeologically rich, but Antalya, uh, you know, representing the uh, Mediterranean um, and, you know, such rich in archaeological heritage, we, we thought that was a good place. In a similar way, Izmir was the right place. Um, and Southeast, because of the threats, you know, because of the you know, conflict, that's in a way the, the whole framework um, of this funding is, is the obvious choice. Uh, but also there is a very rich local press in Turkey. So in every little town, you can, you can find you know, tens of, maybe they are like pamphlets, you know, four pages papers, you know, twice a week or something, but they are there. Uh, so, um, and we chose Diyarbakir uh, as the center. Um, and for all these journalist workshops, actually we uh, work together with the uh, journalist associations. Um, and um, so in that sense, actually, it, it was a very good um, collaboration with these journalist associations, both in Istanbul, but also regionally. We are happy to answer everything also outside. <laughs> um, hello, and first of all, amazing um, project and amazing uh, research. And my question is for Ishulai, actually. So um, I'm interested, more interested in this fee question that you asked uh, to the public. And there was a study in the UK about the fees in museums. And the conclusion was that the fees has minimal impact on the demographics who attend the museums and other cultural sites. But the threshold fear is the real thing. So I wonder, do you have any data on if the museums and archaeological sites in Turkey be free? Would that affect um, demographics that attend these sites? Um, so I just wonder. Yeah, th that would have been a hypothetical question. But I think, I mean, by looking at what um, answers we already have from different questions, I can say that wouldn't be the most important factor to change the visit, visiting habits because actually in the in-depth uh, surveys that we did, they are talking about, okay, that's one issue, but that's not the biggest issue. Uh, so I think more importantly is the cultural capital, like be feeling not part of this whole thing or you know, going there and coming back not understanding things. So when, actually in Turkey, some, sometimes municipalities are organizing these tours to the sites and they are fully booked immediately because there's one guide who talks about the, the site. And I think that's a great strategy and that's something that th this shows us. Yes, entrance fees, they are important, but they are not the, the only factor uh, in, uh, in determining the visit, visiting habits. We should move out. We've got Chris and the whole team is here, and also as well.